Hi, my name's Phil, I like talking about politics, and in this video I'd like to discuss a speech which Sadiq Khan is giving later today, in which he's going to present the findings of new research into the damage that Brexit has caused as he calls for a debate about the customs union single market. But unfortunately, almost nobody will know about it. The challenge we face is not just getting politicians to talk about Brexit. That's already happening. You're just not hearing it. Because what we need to work out is how do we raise the profile of these calls when they make them. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel. So Sadiq Khan is to make a speech at Mansion House today where he's going to discuss the findings from research into the economic impact of Brexit. Tomorrow, you will no doubt see it on the front pages of every newspaper in the country. No, you won't, will you? It won't even be hidden in the darkened recesses of the Daily Express. The headline conclusion is going to be that our economy is currently 6% smaller than it would have been had we remained at least in the single market and customs union. The figure that has been quoted for some time, of course, is that Brexit would keep our economy 4% smaller. So this new re research being larger, you think to yourself, oh, well, what does that mean? Does it mean that the short term impact has been made worse by various factors, possibly including the incompetence of the government, or just that it would start off high and settle down to 4% because the 4% figure was always quoted as a long term figure. But there have been other reports in the last couple of years suggesting that our economy has uh, been held back by, you know, 5.5%. That's the been effective drag effect of Brexit on our economy. So it is consistent with this. The report says that our economy is £140 billion smaller than it would have been, with 1.8 million fewer jobs around the country, and the average Britain £2,000 a year worse off as a result. Now, the actual details of the speech, we'll have to wait until he's given it, of course, but I'd like to discuss a few general points of interest that the speech is being given at all. So the political situation with Brexit right now is as follows. Both the Conservatives and Labour are formally ruling out a return not just to the EU, but to the single market and customs union. However, politics changes. And it often changes very quickly. You know, I can just highlight the post office scandal again, saying we have here a perfect case of how a government policy completely changes as a result of mass public attention. Last week, the government weren't obstructing efforts to get justice for those affected, but they weren't putting their weight behind it either. ITV broadcast a well-received dramatisation of the scandal. All of a sudden, the government are rushing legislation through to deal with what they dragged their feet on for years because that drama was based on events that happened up until 2019. So everything in that drama we knew about in 2019. This is simple political gravity and it applies to every policy you can imagine. However, it does work best on a policy which creates very little friction with the current government. And I've said before, no political party or politicians responsible for the post office scandal. Some can be accused of not giving it sufficient attention, but none are responsible. As such, it's no skin off Tory noses to take the action they've taken this week. That they didn't take it before wasn't because, um, you know, that they didn't want to or it exposed something about themselves. It's just that they couldn't be asked. It wasn't because it was uncomfortable. But Brexit is uncomfortable for the Conservatives. Rishi Sunak has implemented some pragmatic Brexit policies last year. But if you look at them, none of them involved improving things. They all involved stopping the extreme Tory Brexit, making things worse still. Brexit has become a cult for the Conservatives. Now, they're going to need to deal with that. And we need them to deal with it because we cannot make major progress until we can be sure that no matter who's in government, and that can include the Conservatives, and let's be honest, most of the time we have a Conservative government, so we need that. We need the Conservatives to remove that sort of cult-like behaviour if we're to really progress. But of course, they can only deal with their Brexit skeletons in opposition. Yesterday, we had the mad scene of a Conservative MP standing up in Prime Minister's questions and proclaiming that the discovery of some shellfish in the Thames is a Brexit benefit. I kid you not, the, the showpiece event of the parliamentary calendar each week, and that is what a Conservative MP did. Now, let's ignore for the fact, for now, 
that you would not want to eat any shellfish growing in the Thames unless you want your guts to explode. If there were any real Brexit benefits out there, the Tories would be shouting them from the rooftops. The fact that simpletons like this have to scratch around for something so dumb that even the most committed Brexit supporter would raise an eyebrow just highlights how thin is the gruel of Brexit benefits. I mean, what's next? You know, what is next? Are we going to have Michael Fabricant going around looking at a rock on the ground going, Brexit benefit? The EU would make us pick that rock and put it somewhere else. Shellfish in the Thames being discovered, as if either the shellfish couldn't be there or we couldn't have made the discovery whilst we were in the EU. Be serious. But there is no such cult within Labour. As I keep saying, Labour's Brexit stance is a result of the following factors. First, lots of voters were sick of Brexit tearing politics apart and preventing the government from focusing on the basic job of governing. Now, you and I can argue that actually Brexit just gave them cover to do that anyway. The Conservatives don't want to govern. They actually like to let things just run themselves. That is their ideology. But voters don't see it that way. You know, the people who vote Conservative, the majority of them do vote for them to govern. So you can't convince them of that. And these people no more want Labour ministers to waste their days arguing about Brexit than they did Tory ministers. A view, by the way, that's going to be reinforced this summer. You know, you're, um, we, we are looking forward to the COVID inquiry report uh, publishing its first report. They say they're going to do that before the summer. And it's going to show how ministers neglected aspects of COVID response because of a fixation with Brexit. So that is going to feed into this idea that Brexit and Brexit arguments caused the government to fail to deal with the basic issues of governing. The public simply won't accept a Labour government repeating these mistakes. Now, the solution to this is not to ignore it. It is to deal with Brexit, but quietly, in the most boring way imaginable, behind the scenes, whilst public opinion changes. Second, there are target voters who still either think that Brexit can work or that it should be given a bit more time. They're not ready to accept that they weren't just wrong but were conned. People sometimes show that the vast majority of Labour voters are in favour of reversing Brexit in a meaningful way, and this is true, but Labour can't win the election with only those voters. Third, Labour cannot join the single market in the next parliament or even the one after uh, even if, if we start talks to rejoin, there's no mechanism to do it. There is a mechanism to rejoin the entire EU, but we don't yet qualify. I'm hoping there's going to be a mechanism to join the single market. This idea of France's, which hopefully will gain momentum over the next few years. But in the here and now, that mechanism doesn't exist. So to even announce a long term aim to get back inside the EU or even the single market is a promise that is not within Labour's power to keep. So we would be asking Labour to make a promise it knows it can't keep. And if it's asked, how can you keep this promise, would have to say, well, we can't guarantee it. Politically fatal. So the solution to this is to lay the groundwork, do what it can guarantee to do, which doesn't tread on anyone's toes and nudge the political environment towards being ready to go back in the future. This, of course, doesn't help those who are struggling desperately right now, but I mean, that is the consequence of allowing the Tories to do this in the first place. As I keep saying, you can't allow the Tories into government and then change your mind and expect Labour to clear up the mess like Mary Poppins with a snap of their fingers. But going back to Sadiq Khan, and it's first of all, it's interesting, he's not going all out and arguing for a return to the customs union single market because that's what you'd imagine. You're presented with this research. What is this caused by? The fact that we're no longer in the single market of customs union. This is really bad. What should we do about it? go back into the single market and customs union. But that's not the argument because he knows he can't make that argument. What he's asking is that there should be a debate about it. Because, I mean, there's no harm in that, is there? What can be the possible harm in a debate? The public are used to revisiting the wisdom of their votes in the, in the government after a maximum of five years. Every five years, often it's less, but every five years, you get to reevaluate the vote, which determines the entire direction of the country. So why shouldn't people be able to reevaluate a vote on a single policy which took place nearly eight years ago? Doesn't mean to say we have referenda every few years, but we can reevaluate it. We can have a debate because there is no debate at the moment. 
Tory politicians and media shills will talk about Brexit at the drop of a hat if they think they can use it as justification for their latest brain fart. But if you try and bring up Brexit with them, it's all, oh, you're still banging on about this old news. Why can't you move on? And the newspapers and broadcast media go along with this. But people within Labour don't. Sadiq Khan is not an aberration. He's not like you've got Tobias Elwood in the Conservative Party who's saying we should have a discussion about the single market particularly, but also the customs union. So which other Conservatives do that? I mean, we know Michael Heseltine in the House of Lords, for example. But in terms of in the House of Commons or, you know, Conservative councillors, prominent councillors or Conservative mayors, who within the Conservative Party really is championing this idea of having a debate about Brexit? You've got Tobias Elwood and his collection of tumbleweeds. Elwood stands alone. Khan doesn't. He's not even the only prominent Labour politician talking about this. You've got backbench Labour MPs frequently bring up Brexit questions in PMQs and related debates. You just don't always hear about it. Khan is also not the only senior Labour leader to make these views publicly. Right now, Labour have got their heads down. They've got their eyes on the prize. They're going to win. Once they're in power, it's clear that they will not only want to do everything they can to boost the economy, the number of and quality of jobs and the general standard of living, but they have to. See, the Conservatives can win elections even when they make things worse. Labour never do. When have Labour ever won an election from a position of being in government after things got worse. They've never done that. It was only under the last Labour government they ever won from power. Never happened. Sometimes even when they've made things better, they've still lost. So Labour can't afford to ignore the impact of Brexit on the economy. It's simply impossible. What they will want is a public desire to debate where we are with Brexit and where we should be going. You know, some may think quite reasonably, well, Starmer doesn't really want this debate happening. I think he does. He just can't call for it. Because if he calls for that debate, that is saying to voters, I think we should argue about Brexit and I think I should take my eye off all the things you want me to deal with. He can't do that. He has to be focused on delivering as the public understand it. So what we need is the public to realise that delivering all the things they want is currently shackled by, amongst other things, the extreme Tory Brexit. So Sadiq Khan can call for a debate. Really easy, not trading on anyone's toes. As can others in Labour, and they will do. And after the election, expect those noises to get a bit louder. And within other parties, of course. And it would be quite good if we saw the Conservatives against Brexit pop their heads above the parapets again. The question is how to make it happen. Because I only know about this speech later today because I read about it in the Financial Times. After the speech, there'll probably be another article in the Financial Times about what he said at some point tomorrow or the day after. I'm sure it'll be in the New European, maybe in Byline Times. There may be, in the darkened corners of the Express, after all, there may be some mention where they decide to attack the use of public money for this. Other than that, I don't think you'll see it anywhere. So when a prominent politician does try to start a debate, how can we make sure it gets traction when the media are so unwilling? That is the nut to crack. But there we are. Those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. Hope you found the video interesting. If you did, please click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, the join button for memberships. And until next time, I'll see you later.